How's it, everybody? Before we start today's episode, we have to issue a really quick correction from the last episode, which was the weird and wacky rules and interactions. We got one thing wrong. It was pointed out by a lot of people. Thank you. It was the it that betrays interaction. So we incorrectly stated that it that betrays will steal other people's commanders, even if they choose to let it go to the graveyard and then to the command zone. That is not actually the case. That used to be the case before they changed the commander dies triggers rule. Uh, I don't know if you remember, which was, I think, uh, a little over a year back. Um, it's similar to the banishing light thing. So, yep, we just we just messed up on that rule. We uh, double-checked it in the wrong places, but we did hear from the rules manager from Wizards of the Coast that it that betrays will no longer be able to steal commanders that go to the command zone. It loses track of it when they are sort of rezoned after they hit the graveyard. So we just want to let everybody know that so not everybody's out there playing it that betrays incorrectly. It is a card we definitely see in commander, so wanted to uh, issue that correction. Uh, and one other thing I want to say before we get into the, the full episode here, the new episode, is that uh, Gavin Verhey, our friend, uh, game designer at Wizards of the Coast, has a channel called Good Morning Magic. And literally like the day after we released our Weird and Wacky Rules Interaction episode, he released a video um, about some cool ninjutsu uh, rules hacks that is along the same line. So if you liked the last episode, I just wanted to plug Gavin's channel and that video because there's some cool stuff you can do with ninjutsu, which is obviously going to be in Kamigawa Neon Dynasty here coming up. So stuff you might want to know about. So check that out and then, uh, you know, or check it out after you watch the rest of this episode, which we'll get into right now. Greetings, humans. You have entered the Command Zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. Hey! Man, you're talking back to me! Take, Take them out, out, you gotta keep, keep them underrated. Hey! Man, you disrespected me! Take them out, you gotta keep them underrated. <laughs> Wow, not bad. What's up, everybody? You are watching slash listening to the Command Zone podcast. I'm one your host, Jimmy Wong. How's it? It's Josh Lee Kwai. <laughs> that song does have relevance to what we're talking about today because we are answering a bunch of very interesting and very thought-provoking listener-submitted questions. Yeah, we do this a few times a year. Uh, I think last year we didn't get a chance to do it because so much product was introduced. <laughs> Hooray. Uh, we get a lot of questions through email, comments, Twitter, stuff like that, um, and we try to answer that stuff directly as much as possible, but as you would imagine, we get thousands of correspondence over yeah. the course of the year. So the questions start to pile up and the interesting ones we sort of keep off to the side and we use for episodes like this uh, questions that have an interesting discussion but maybe aren't like a full hours show worth of talk, you know? Yeah, it's good enough to, and it's definitely very worthy questions because oftentimes we'll find 10, 20, even 50 people sometimes are asking the same thing, but that single question we could answer in five minutes with a discussion. So what we do is we throw them into these episodes and they're some of our most fun episodes to record because we get to cover a lot of stuff and really have some thought-provoking conversations with the audience as well. Yeah, jump around to a few different topics. So today, some of the questions we're going to be covering are things like, which mechanic do we think is the most underrated? Ooh. How many pieces of graveyard hate should you put into your, uh, your deck when you're entering like an unknown meta? Uh, is targeted land destruction totally taboo? Ooh. We've got those questions. Much more we're going to be discussing in this episode. But before we get into it, we got to shout out our sponsors, channelfireball.com slash command. That is Ooh. the best place to go to get all your magic products, singles, anything at all. You know you're going to order magic cards anyway. Channelfireball.com slash command. Or you can use code command at checkout if you forget to use the URL. Channel Fireball Marketplace really is the best place if you're going to like pre-order mm -hmm. Kamigawa Neon Dynasty stuff, which is definitely something you want to do right oh, now. What about those unlands, those oh. new shock lands and the basics from that set look incredible incredible from infinity oh. yeah all that stuff looks amazing channel fireball dot com slash command the place to go you're gonna get the price best prices you're dealing with licensed professionals so you're gonna get a really good uh buyer experience yep and they also stock all sorts of different card games too so if it's not just magic there's lots of other stuff to find there and when you get those cards make sure you put them into a protective sleeve into a top loader maybe even into a deck box that will survive the test of time that's right ultra pro makes the products that we trust here on the show and in our own personal lives and collections we're going to talk a lot about the decks that we play today and some very interesting cards and those cards when you get them you want to protect them you want to keep them nice and pristine or play them on the play mat that makes their you know their presence that much more felt <laughs> <laughs> definitely ultra pro allows you to just kind of 
of spice up your battlefield the most because they have the sleeves, the deck boxes, the playmats that can all be themed around the same art, the same set, all the Kamigawa stuff. Ultra Pro has it. So yeah, yeah definitely the ones we trust. And the final way to support all of our content is directly if you go to patreon.com slash command zone. You know, we started doing something oh, just, yeah. Yeah, just recently for our patrons that we've never really done before. Exclusive content. Yeah, so we have a video right now that only patrons will have access to. We're not putting it on the main channel. It is Jimmy and I doing commentary and reacting to the very first episode of Game Nights. In fact, when the show wasn't even called Game Nights yet. Yeah, it was called Out of the Box. Yeah. We got the pre-cons for 2016 Commanders, and we were like, you know what? What happens if we just sit down and just throw some cameras up, play it, and we learned a lot from there, but that was the genesis of the show, and we get to react to it. You get to see Josh's unhinged reactions to his uh, early work, I suppose. A lot, of, <laughs> a lot of me being like, what was I doing? Why yeah. did we do that? Uh, yeah, so I know a lot of our patrons have really liked watching that video. We're planning this year to produce more exclusive content for patrons. Uh, patrons already get a lot of other perks, like yeah. access to the Discord, watching Game Nights and Extra Turns early, and in fact, we also shout out one lucky patron every single episode, and this, this episode, episode is dedicated, dedicated to, to Rob Mossup. Rob, you rock. You gotta keep them separated. So if you wanna see that exclusive content, patreon.com slash command zone. Okay. You gotta keep them underrated. Yeah, underrated, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta keep them underrated or overrated, but in this case, underrated. All right, we're gonna tackle a lot of great questions today. Normally we're, again, big topics, big things, but this, a lot of very interesting questions have come in because we haven't done this for a while, so I'm excited. If you would like... If you have a question for us and you would like your question to be featured on a future episode like this, mm -hmm. it's very easy. You just send a question to us uh, through email is probably the best, but you can do it in the comment section on Twitter and things too. But if you really want to stand out, email is the best. And the email to use is contact at commandzone.com. And make sure you use the subject heading question time. Question time. Yeah, that's an old joke uh, if you've listened <laughs> to the show for a while. But that'll just help us find it later on when we're like, oh, we're doing a, a Q&A episode. We can search through the email and find it a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. And of course, we don't need to feature your name on the episode either or your full question. We yeah. usually edit them down for brevity and, or use pseudonyms. So just let us know in that if that's the case but you can use that email it's a new one contact at commandzone.com with that subject header question time uh, and really quickly we are going to split this episode up into two sections because there's kind of two types of questions we get mm -hmm. one category is commander and magic related stuff and the other category is based on content creation questions about the behind the scenes uh, of game nights or something like that so we're going to start with commander and magic stuff and then we'll move on to the content related stuff and as jimmy said a lot of these questions are not direct quotes from the people. They've been edited for clarity or brevity, and we're not using uh, everybody's real name a lot of time. In fact, we're only going to do first names here. A lot of people, for whatever reason, they don't want their play group to know that they've asked us this specific question <laughs> sometimes. There is this guy. It's a friend of mine. It, it, you know, you might nice know someone like them in my play group. Yeah, yeah, none of those. Okay. All right. Question number one comes from Billy, and Billy asks, what do you think is the most underrated mechanic in Commander and why? We're wasting no time. We're starting with the topic heading as the first question here. Um, most underrated mechanic in Commander. I am going to say haste. Haste. Wow. So that is one of the most also most common uh, mechanics in Commander. Yeah, it's not a it's not a mechanic that's rare or that mm -hmm. we don't see a lot. This is an evergreen mechanic, and I feel like it's underrated, and I feel like it's often incorrectly utilized. Oh, I see. So haste is so strong because surprise is such an important factor in Commander. Yeah. Imagine how many times has this happened, Jimmy, where you look around the table and you're like, well, nobody's got any Blocker, creatures yeah. out right now and there's nothing dangerous to me. So I'm going to make a play based on the fact that I can't see anything mm -hmm. that's going to be able to get at me or do anything really, really scary. Yeah. For me, usually it's like I want to get out to a head or I need to attack or do something to trigger something as well because my decks are usually based around attacking. Yeah. And you, so you're looking, you're like, it feels safe because I can see that nobody's got any creatures out or whatever. And so you'll make a move based on the fact that like it, it looks like I'm not going to be able to get cracked back on. Yeah, I'll this. develop this turn instead of attacking or whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. And haste really gets around that and can often solve problems for you that wouldn't otherwise be solvable. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the big things about haste and the reason why maybe players um, undervalue it is because if you don't use it correctly, then it feels worse than it is. And oh, I think the correct way to use it is to not play out your haste creatures 
for the most part until the haste is pretty pertinent. Yeah, and and not necessarily just creatures to attack too. You have activated abilities on creatures that or things that grant them haste. Yeah, well, and if you've got anger in your graveyard or you've got haste granters like that, a lot of times that's on board and people can see it. But haste on a creature in hand yeah. is just something that's very hard for your opponents to predict. Mm. And if you sort of save that haste for a rainy day rather than put it out early, I think it's often much more effective. So let's imagine scenarios where like you've had a sort of feast and famine in play and they've removed the creatures and they feel like, okay, well, he, they, they're pretty well under control because right. what are the chances they're going to be able to activate their sort of feast and famine on their next turn and really go off? Well, it's pretty low unless you have a haste creature in yeah. play, in which case you could maybe get them out. Of, oh, 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 there's no creatures out right now. I'm going to play my Planeswalker. It looks pretty safe, and I might be able to take them up and really get into a powerful position because there's nothing that's going to be able to get out of this Planeswalker. Boom, yeah. haste. A lot of times people are like, oh, there's no creatures right now. I'm going to make a play, leave myself a little bit open, but I'm probably not in danger of dying because I can't see anything. Boom, haste comes out of nowhere. So that's that's why I think haste has often gotten me because, uh, I, you know, full disclosure, I'm not the player that plays necessarily <laughs> with a ton of haste. I mean, I've dabbled. You love anger in the graveyard, though, yeah. that's for sure. But that's they can see it, so they're calculating for that. Um, yeah, I will say, too, maybe this is a case to not actually play your Swift Foot Boots out or your Lightning Greaves yeah. out unless you really need to protect something because those both have haste and either Shroud or Hexproof. You know, and maybe the equip costs are so low. Maybe we could do a whole episode on haste because that's a really good point. I think probably a lot of people are misplaying or not properly getting like the most amount of value out of their swift foot boots and lightning grids. I mean, obviously they're in your decks a lot of times to protect your commander. Yeah. But yeah, if yeah. they're not going to do that thing right now and that's not important, then I think it a lot of times probably is correct. It's like a three mana haste grantor for both of them. Right. Right. And you got to weigh a lot of options, a, a lot of, a lot of factors. Um, you know, they cost some mana and if you mm -hmm. can't use that mana in another way right now it might be better to put them out or something like that but there are probably points where it's better to hold your lightning greaves play it with a creature suit it up do a thing get in there you know maybe knock somebody out or get an important thing out of the way yeah, yeah. And, and like i said if you saved your haste for a rainy day you'd be able to do that where instead of just blowing it early in the game at a point that's not that impactful yeah, I like that a lot. I also think one thing that people should think about is that artifacts that tap for mana also kind of have pseudo haste. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you play a creature, you can't use it that same turn. People forget that artifacts, newer players usually, can tap the turn they come down. So you can have really explosive turns by sequencing out the mana rocks in your hand so that you can use them to play something else and yada yada. Yeah, so saving that up and thinking of your play pattern. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a way that like aggro decks or attacky decks probably should be played a little more often to give them a better chance to win the game. Save those haste creatures, those haste enablers. Make sure your opponents don't know about them. Yeah. Get as far as you can with the threat level of what they can see that's slower. And then when you need that final punch. Wait for them to sort of do something that is based on your board state, but not your hand. And then go Haha, haste, you didn't see this coming. Boom, I get you. Yeah, I think to that degree, you could maybe also put trample in with a, as a very important and underrated mechanic. But it's, it's probably pretty regularly rated now because trample's amazing. Regularly rated? Regularly you rated. You gotta keep them regularly, regularly rated. rated. Oh, that does uh, not <laughs> ring well. All right, um, Jimmy, what is your, what do you think is the most underrated mechanic in Commander and a slightly more deep cut because I just don't see many cards with this out there even though there are plenty of great options it is Convoke oh. so Convoke is a mechanic that says your creatures can help cast this spell and each creature you tap while casting the spell pays for one generic mana or one mana of that creature's color so this means that you can be tapping creatures on your board for colored mana for Convoke spells um, some of the biggest Convoke spells out there are Hour of Reckoning which is a board wipe that kills on non all non-token creatures so you can use your tokens to tap for it and cast it there's also March of the Multitudes which makes bunch of tokens and then court of calling Woo. is the big obvious one. one it's the one where you can tutor out a creature i think the reason is because this allows you to cheat out mana and it doesn't need you to play a cryptolith right in order to do it mm. uh you can just do it from the card in your hand now obviously this only works in decks that have creatures to tap but honestly i think if you can tap two three creatures and not leave yourself in the position where a hasty player can kill you <laughs> It, it really does help lower the mana cost of cards that otherwise are a little bit high in the CMC. Like, Our Reckoning, I think, is an eight mana value card. But in a token deck, or even a deck with a couple of creatures in it, you're casting it for six, five, and if you can benefit off that side, that's great. So I like Convoke a lot. It's a way to cheat out mana cost. I hope they do more of it in the future. Um, I like the idea of rewarding you for building up a board state that is a little more fragile, because you can then use it in different ways. Hooray. Yeah, I think Convoke 
I mean, anything that turns all of your creatures basically into mana creators, yeah. we know is powerful, like Cryptolithrite and things like that. And this is another way to do that. I mean, Court of Calling, such a powerful card. Instant speed, too, yep. so you can convoke it end step. You don't even need to tap on your main phase to do it. It's often a great way to protect your board state when you have a large board state, because yeah. having a large board state is when it's good, because you have a lot of creatures that are going to be able to tap for mana. And that's also when you're the most vulnerable, because you have a large board state, so somebody's trying to probably blow it up. Mm -hmm. And definitely, I have gone to blow up people's board state where they go, Court of Calling, Avacyn, and you're like, Crap. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I just saved everything Kinda and I'm like, now probably dead yeah that, that the surprise factor again is a big part of it and there are a few co uh, convoke spells that are instant speed so that's why I like it a lot and then the o OG from back when we played standard for about two seconds was stoke the flames another great card with convoke on it Oh, the good old standard days. Yeah, one of Josh and I played for one and a half tournaments, and we're like, this sucks. As soon as rotation hit us one time, we were like, well, we're not doing that again. <laughs> yeah. That was the worst. That was a nice My experiment. Whole just went away? Yeah. <laughs> Overnight? But it's what got us into magic originally. It was that, that, that cons era, which is a lot of fun. Yeah, it was really limited, though. I don't want yeah, 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 to give credit to standard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just played standard because we had all the cards. We had all the cards, and I still had to buy some extras. And then, again, rotation, I was like, why did I, why did oh, I do I that? Oh, I still have all four Teamer Sabertooths, which are doing <laughs> nothing for me. <laughs> Sorry, I meant to say Savage Knuckle Blade. Oh, yeah, Big Nux. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, got, I got screwed up because Teamer Sabertooth has the word Teamer in it, and Big Nux is yeah, oh, Teamer. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, you get it. Question number two. I know that land destruction is frowned upon in casual circles, but I lost to a glacial chasm the other day because <laughs> I just had no way to deal with it. Are you playing him? <laughs> or her? Sorry. I'm not sure what I should do. If I put strip mine or the like in all of my decks, are people going to hate me? And this is from Daisy. The answer is no, Daisy. Strip mine is an incredible card. So is Wasteland. That There's a reason also that they've been climbing in price. And mass land destruction is frowned upon. Yeah, I think that's gotten a little bit confused in the community uh mass land destruction being armageddon and things that destroy all lands or destroy a lot of lands mm -hmm. i would put like wildfire and things in there that every player you know has to sacrifice for or a lot of lands uh as things that are frowned upon mm -hmm. by most casual commander players but in general single target land destruction in my experience has not been frowned upon and if people are frowning upon it is that a thing um, yeah i think they're probably misconstruing like definitely you should have the ability in your deck to answer a cabal coffers or answer gaia's cradle well gaia's cradle for sure or answer a land that somebody has put you know some amount of enchantments on or right. also or blast zone yeah you know, those kinds of cards yeah also i think you want strip mine and wasteland in all of your decks now if you can obviously they're not cheap cards so it some some kind of land destruction in your decks if possible because of imprisoned in the moon and song of the dryads oh yeah so yeah, yeah. if they cast that onto your commander it can just be very hard for some decks to figure out a way to get their commander back and one of the ways you can do it it's not the you know it sucks but <laughs> it's strip one yourself i've definitely done it right you Ooh. play strip mine strip mine you're imprisoned in the moon commander it goes to the command zone it's not the best but at least like i'm back in the game because so often now if my commander's not out the deck just doesn't do anything because that's just how commander is more often played than in the old days yeah and there's lots of other there's like ghost quarter there's a lot of yeah. options out there as well for ones that don't fully punish the person they're allowed to get a land or there's a newer one that you both get to get a land when you sacrifice it so you're never down on the land so there are other other ways to do it strip mine and wasteland are the most expensive because they can just you can play it that same turn tap it and get rid of it now things that players do frown upon daisy is if you have a crucible of the world or ramming up excavator in your deck and then you're playing these lands out of your graveyard every turn sometimes multiple times and getting rid of multiple lands or if you're singularly targeting one person with repeated land destruction or cards like plow under that is what's frowned upon because you are taking away stripping away the ability for people to play the game and sometimes in a way that feels way too targeted yeah I would say those are things you can choose to do, too. Like, you don't have to play your strip mine with your Ramonac Excavator. Um, <laughs> Please You don't. can if you want to. I've done it, for sure, if somebody's done something else that I think is equally as bad. Control, yeah, yeah, it's like, oh, whatever, sorry, if, I'm going to strip a, mine three of your lands. <laughs> if a Glacial Chasm is winning the game for that player, the other players at the table should not have any issues with you getting rid of it. Because at the end of the day, you are playing your land for the turn and using it to get rid of that card. So you're actually down the card, too. Yeah, it's definitely not an advantageous play to play a strip mine and strip mine somebody's land. As far as like that player's down a card, you're down a card, the other two players are up a card. So I don't think there's anything 
that should be frowned upon by the community. That's just like a straight up fair play. It's yeah. it's when you go to Armageddon and then, you know, with your suspended creatures on the stack or something <laughs> like that, that people start to get a little bit salty. Generally that does win the game though. I don't, I don't tend to mind land destruction as much for that reason, but I get yeah. why people don't like it. Cause they're like, you took away my ability to cast stuff and play the game. One land is not your ability to cast stuff and play the game. It's multiple lands that really starts to be like, well, I can't do anything now. Yeah. And lands again are considered the most powerful part of the magic by many players because they are generally very hard to interact with. You'll see the words non-land permanent uh, on a lot of cards these days because they don't want people to just be taking out lands willy-nilly. Yeah, I think we should take off the stigma of getting rid of lands and making them sacrosanct a a little bit more than we do, actually, if anything. Mm. I think we're a little bit too far on the side of, you know, land destruction is frowned upon. I think we should move it back towards... We should normalize it a little bit, as they I mean, would say. If, I would say if you're playing against someone that plays five mana rocks and then they have three lands out, it's definitely okay to get rid of one of their lands because they're showing that they can expand their mana in other ways. So. All right. Oh, there's just so many lands now that are just like, you know, somebody puts out Field of the Dead or whatever. Oh like, my you've got to be able to get rid of yeah, those yeah, lands. Yeah. They just do a lot these days. So. Yeah, sure. They do a lot. All right. Let's move on to question number three. All right. How many graveyard hate should you put in your deck while preparing for an unknown meta? Should you focus on versatile ones or effective pieces just so you don't get caught unprepared? Thank you, Daniel, for a very good question there. Jimmy, how many pieces of graveyard hate would you say the average deck you built includes? And this is for our meta, obviously. I would say three to four. And if it's a black deck, almost always one of them is Bajukabog because yeah. it doesn't take up uh, actual card slot. Similarly, like right, single target removal, you could say uh, strip mine is kind of like single target removal. Yeah. Scavenger Grounds is another one. Scavenger so Grounds, yeah. I put sure. that in almost every deck because that card is just really good. And now we have Douthy Voidwalker that also is kind of like an auto include in a lot of black, black decks. decks yeah. yeah, and then I would say like Rest in Peace, even though I barely play any decks with white, and that Rest in Peace is just an incredible card that should go in a lot of decks. Leyline of the Void. I I I tend to stray away from the ones that just turn off the whole graveyard strategies. Right. Bajuka Bog. Scavenger Grounds, they are cards that like you use it once and it has a big effect, but it doesn't s- stop their strategy from that point forward. Mm-hmm. Whereas Rest in Peace is just like, boom, kind of like Blood Moon. Hey, sorry, Graveyard decks, you can't do anything, anything until you get rid of this thing. Bye bye. Yeah, I tend to not use that kind of stuff as much, although I do play Dalthy Void Rocker, it's just too good. Pretty good. Um, I would say for an unknown meta, there's a lot of Graveyard Hate stuff that's kind of like neutral if you just that has cycling on it kind of like oh, relic of progenitus yeah um does the thing where you know it hoses graveyards but it draws you a card and it does it one time yeah so it you you basically can just wait to use it at the most opportune time but it doesn't completely destroy someone's deck they'll just go back restart their engine blah blah, blah. there, are the, there yeah. are the lantern soul guide lantern lantern oh, yeah. of the lost both have a draw card aspect they're cheap they don't do what rest in peace does but i think that's enough when going into an unknown meta that like hey if they're not playing graveyard stuff you just pay one pay pay a second one draw a card and it doesn't have a large effect but two mana draw a card is gonna just cycle through your deck it's not like you played Tormach crypt or something does yeah. literal nothing and cost you the card <laughs> what i do like are cards like ashiok dream render because mm-hmm. this is multiple uses of land uh, i mean of graveyard hate um but i think in an unknown meta you would be fine with just a few pieces and then if you have tutors in your deck then you know that that's a redundant piece that you can go find that card should it be really necessary yep all right, that's a good question, though. I like it. Thank you, Daniel. All right, so question number four. Occasionally, I'll see players playing for second place, meaning that in the late game and convinced they cannot win, they will target players other than the one in the commanding lead. I think this is poor sportsmanship. What are your thoughts from Chris? Uh, you know, they they do say that if you come second in a race, you're the first loser, right? <laughs> No, that all it doesn't is, matter if you win by an inch or a, a mile. mile. Winning's winning. <laughs> Thanks, Dom. Um, I will say that I think Commander is not even about playing for second place or first place in general. I like playing Commander for fun. So I think if someone's trying to gun for second place and they're trying to knock out people as someone is already surging ahead, to me it feels like, well, you kind of missed the challenge there. It would have been fun to try and get rid of the arch enemy, right? Instead of just letting them run away with it. But I don't personally, I feel like I don't really have too many issues one way or the other with someone that would do this in the game with me. I look at Commander a lot of like what makes you quote unquote good at Commander or maybe fun to me about Commander as like predictive social modeling. Mm -hmm. And so if a person does that, that is a thing I should have been able to read about them and maybe take advantage of. So, But now you know for the future games too. Yeah. And so maybe they're the person I 
particularly want to be in second place and putting them into that position is actually a strategic advantage mm-hmm. that I'm, you know, using on purpose right, right. as a thing. I don't think it's poor sportsmanship at all because the way a person reacts genuinely in the moment just kind of is how multiplayer social dynamics should work, right? Yeah, and and we should be abiding by what players want to do yeah. um, unless it's just so egregious and so offensive that it makes people not want to play with them. And I think this is far from that. Yeah, as long as they're using their cards yeah. and fair effects within the game, Whatever they decide they want to accomplish within the game, like it's it's not really that much different than complaining if a person is like, well, they built a story deck and they're trying to like tell <laughs> a certain story. They're not even trying to win. Well, that's how they're playing the game. And if you're trying to win, your goals are not aligned, but that doesn't mean that you can't use each other right. to help that you each advance whatever your goals are. I mean, yeah, we're, we're famous for always saying like, however you enjoy the game, that's the way you should play it. And I don't think it's poor sportsmanship to not try to win uh, because there's a lot of ways that people go about not trying to win or not trying super hard, hard to, to win. win. Yeah. If they win, cool, but they're not specifically gunning for it. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot of players who are like, oh, I'm trying to build this weird combination of cards that I built this deck to do. And, I, you know, if I win, that's cool. But I've seen a lot of players like, I don't care. I did my thing. Yeah. I'm happy. And they're not poor sports. So I don't think that's inherently that different than somebody who's like, well, whatever. I can't win this game, but I'm going to make sure I get second. Yeah, I would also say like you'll know after the game whether or not that decision was one that really upset a lot of people. And if it is one that you find is consistently happening, they're only right. If, if it gets bad, then that's the kind of thing where you go, OK, we've seen a few cases studies of this now we know that this leaves players around the table feeling x y and z so let's talk about it and that is again part of that whole rule zero slash post game discussion that people are starting to talk about now for commander which is when you're done maybe that's a time to reflect and think about the things that you may have felt and if this is one of those things and it's getting out of control then you can have a conversation for it but i think both josh and i are on the same page here I think there are like sketchy borderline scummy things you can do within the game too. Well, like conceding at instant speed. I was just going to say that. That's yeah. exactly the point I was going to make. I think that, you know, we have a general rule in our play group that you can only concede at sorcery speed. Mm-hmm. And this is just so that if someone's attacking you and they have a bunch of lifelink or something and you're mad because they're killing you, you don't get to just spite concede. You don't get the lifelink. Ha ha ha. Because that's just not using game mechanics. Yeah. You're like to, cheating the system to yeah. spite someone else. So that kind of stuff d- definitely rubs me the wrong way if people try and pull that but i don't think anything you're doing that's legally allowed to be done with the cards that you've brought into the game is generally unsportsmanlike this did make me think of a related discussion we had around the office jimmy Uh uh-huh um so this is not a listener question but it was related enough and i thought interesting to bring up we played a game the other day um and someone was getting attacked for lethal in Mm. that game and they had some blockers up and you know, decided to block in a way that hurt the attacking player the most, like yep. killed a couple of their creatures, but they were still going to die no matter how they blocked. Right. And there was a discussion in that game about, well, you know, you're going to die. Why are you killing that player's creatures? You're, mm-hmm. you, you know, you're king making in a way you could just let it all through since you're going to die anyway, so that they don't take a disadvantage from attacking you. I see. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Well, where do you land on this? Oh, I'm definitely like, if you are coming after me, and especially if I'm in a play group that I play with a lot, like yeah. I want to establish that, like, listen, whatever I can do with my cards, <laughs> I will to harm you. I will, because I need you to calculate into every future game from here on out. Yes, I could take Josh out, but in so doing, I will injure myself to the point where I probably won't win this game. So I need to wait for a better moment. Yeah. And that gives Josh me as the player, maybe a little bit of leeway in situations. Maybe they have to leave me alone or be wary. I don't know what punches he can throw as he's going down. That might be able to like hurt me a lot to the point where I can't win this game anymore. And I like establishing that. I think there's a lot of value in, you know, you get a lot of game value in that over the course of, you know, many, many games. Yeah, I like doing whatever you can to the player that's attacking you just because it feels right. (laughs) It's a very, like, blunt way of putting it. But like, hey, if you're going to take me out, then I'm going to do whatever I can to stop you. Also, you should be at making them wonder do they have something can they yeah. stop me from killing them and those kinds of decisions sometimes will make someone not attack you at all so i think just like lying back or being like i'm going to take care of other things around the table or i'm not going to do anything at all doesn't actually put you in an advantageous position for that game or the future because you don't want people to think that you've got no bite either yeah i like that exactly that statement i mean imagine a player a mythical player who if they're attacked for lethal or anything they just concede and they let you not lose anything in the exchange even when they can yeah 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 you always take that player out when you have the chance right because 
what is the downside to you? There's nothing. Whereas the player who's more like you and I, that's like, hey, listen, if I've got path to exile on my way out, I'm going to take out your best creature. I'm going to block. I'm going to trade. You have to calculate that into, and that means that sometimes you don't make a move that you might otherwise make. Yeah, and sometimes other players can be indebted to you doing this on the way out and actually save your life because they're like, actually, I've been holding on to a path myself. I know that they're actually me. I will get rid of his big creature so that you don't die. Yeah, or use my maze to save you. Yeah, and, yeah. And, you know, and then I'll make a deal with you or whatever. But if I if you didn't block and do everything else, then they can't even save you, right? Yeah, I think Commander is about the group up until the point where you're getting swung out for lethal and then it's about you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this next question, uh, we get a lot of people asking some variation of, I mean, hundreds of people. Um, so it's going to be from Lewis, but it, whoever you are that's asked this question, again, a lot of you, this could be you. Thank you. Which sets would you recommend to new commander players looking to buy a box and boost their commander collection with good playable cards? Mm, unopened alpha. <laughs> So I can see it happen. <laughs> if you do that, will you please stream it? Yeah, please stream it. You have it. to be like, there's there's like three in existence, yeah, maybe. I don't even think there's that many yet. Uh, I think this is actually a really easy question, and I'm going to be able to update it at the end of this year, hopefully. But I think the Commander Legends set has to just be one of the easiest slam dunk. I want to get into Commander. I want an assortment of cards that work for multiplayer, that work for group settings, and you can just buy them. You can find Commanders in there. They're everywhere. There's old ones. There's the etch foils and stuff, too. Lots of options there and some very powerful cards as well and a, a banned card but we don't talk about that one <laughs> <laughs> All breacher yeah that's a really good one i think obviously commander legends is designs for commander so it's likely to have the most goodies and we know there are like 71 legendary creatures in that thing yeah, so yeah you're yeah. likely to get a lot of options for decks to build cool partner pairings and stuff too I would say just anything within the last couple of years. I mean, depending on what your budget range is, generally whatever is the most recent set is the cheapest mm -hmm. to get. If your heart is set on like, I'm going to buy booster packs and crack booster packs in order to build my collection. Because, you know, what Jimmy and I have talked about a lot recently on the show is just how powerful new cards are in the format. Yeah. And so anything from the last couple of years is going to be, you know, in the it, all those cards are strong enough to play in Commander because they've been designing stuff for our format now where they didn't used to. So if, if you bought something from like Cons Block or something like that, like yeah, years, very years few ago, of those cards actually are going to be. Now we're not going to use the word playable, but ideal. How about that? Yeah, you'll just have less cards that are sort of commander caliber for, you know, the greater oh, world like of commander out there. And so I think like newer sets are probably the most sort of jam-packed especially within yeah. the last two years because they did the year of commander and then th then 2021 felt like even more year of commander yeah so there's just a lot of stuff there and then then i think it's down to just preference like do you like vampires do you like werewolves oh yeah which set is it that kind of speaks to you because you're going to get a lot of legendary creatures that's just how they build sets now and you're going to get a lot of commander playable cards because they're seeding more of that stuff in than they used to and commander's legend Baldur's gate is coming out this year oh, so yeah. that i might we, wait for that yeah yeah who knows nah, people don't nah. wait well i would also say strixhaven of all the sets i think are uh, great because they had a very specific focus on the enemy color pairs and so there are all of them and the ally color pairs too i think right no just the enemy. just the enemy yeah. yeah so that that's a great place to start two colors is a very good entry point for commander i like that i would say strixhaven anything from the last couple of years but strix strixhaven or commander legends i like strixhaven a lot and i'm back to school all right uh this is a related question this next one um i'll let you <laughs> read it but it's very similar we get a lot of ask this a lot too all right i have a few pre-cons but a relatively small collection should i buy sealed or singles from caleb so these two questions are obviously related because I think there is this feeling among newer players of like, my collection is small. I just don't have a lot of cards. Yeah. And what is the best way to go about sort of having Enhancing more cards in my collection. collection. And you see your friend, you know, like mm -hmm. ours is Craig. Craig has a lot of cards, <laughs> a lot of cards, like, a lot of cards. He's been playing for 20 plus years, so. And so when we got into Commander, I remember looking at the, just the amount of stuff that Craig had and just thinking like, he has so many more cards than I have. I need to get more cards because I want to be able to build more decks and stuff. And Craig has a million, you know, he had 40 yeah, yeah. decks at that point and I had two. <laughs> uh, so I, I know why new players like feel the the desire to sort of grow their collection it's not like they want any specific deck so much as they just want options because you and i can sit at home jimmy and like pour can, over many many cards yeah if we want to build a deck we'll 
figure it out. Yeah. Now, there, there'll probably be cards we want to order to sort of optimize it and make it better. But in general, like, uh, I can make a functional deck of almost anything just because my collection is fairly large now. Yeah. And and if you should ask yourself, right, are you looking to have a collection that you can just open up, pick from, and build a deck out of scratch? It's or overrated, you, by the way. Uh, yeah, exactly. I was going to say that, too. Are you looking to more specifically build into your favorite colors? Are you just, you care about, like Josh said earlier, you just love werewolves or vampires? Um, and ask yourself that because that will also base change the answer that we'll give you, I think. Yeah. It's totally overrated to have a big collection that you can just build stuff from uh, because you will always have cards that you wish you that you need for this deck that you just don't own. And I don't care how long you've been in Magic. It still happens to Craig, yeah. for instance. So I would and say... And the cards pile up, too. Yeah. You know, you're thinking, oh, I'm going to get all these cards. It's so cool. I have access to all these things. And then you're looking at piles of cards to the left and the right. You're losing track of things. It's hard to keep track of all of them. Okay, let me ask you a question. I know the answer, but just for the audience. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever ordered a card that you 100% know you own, but you're ordering it because you don't want to have to find it? It's not, yeah, well, it's not just that I don't want to have to find it. I actually just don't know where it is. Right. Because I'm like, is you don't it in look one it. of those decks? If it is in the deck, then I do need another one for this new deck. If it's not one of those decks, which of these 70 boxes I'm looking at is it going to be in? I'm just going to pay a quarter and get another one. Yes. There was a card. <laughs> I was building a deck the other night. There's a card from like Battle for Zendikar. It's like a common. Oh, yeah. There's no. <laughs> and I was like, I know where my Battle for Zendikar stuff is. It's in the back of my closet over there. Oops. And I'll have to take down like nine boxes, Ugh. find the box with it, search through it, find it, then put all that back. And I was like, I'm just going to pay 25 cents for the card. Yeah. 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 So big collection overrated caleb time, this is time is valuable yeah if you're gonna take 30 minutes to find a card maybe that's worth more than a quarter <laughs> so caleb this is a long way of telling you buy singles not sealed product if you want to build your collection trust me it, your collection will still build over time yeah. if you want yeah. the joy of cracking packs and all that stuff playing limited playing limited uh you can buy regular booster packs or the collector's boosters seem like a really fun cracking experience for modern horizons 2 for commander legends and for obviously a lot of the feature sets but that's if you just want to have flashy cool cards and, and then maybe you have the goal of trading it maybe you have the goal of going to your store and selling it back to the store and getting redemption in which case you can buy some sealed product but otherwise josh and i it, it's it's obvious buy singles buy singles channelfireball.com slash command Okay. You got to keep them <laughs> separated. The singles. Under, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, from the sealed products. <laughs> Regular rated. <laughs> All right. Uh, question number six. I like this one. If you could have a superhero as your commander, who would it be? This is from Zach. I would have it be Josh Lee Kwai, <laughs> hero of the command zone. <laughs> da, da, da. Um, I, I was thinking about all of the Marvel and the DC superheroes, and this one was pretty obvious to me. I wanted it to be The Flash. Oh, nice. It's super fast. It's red. It's hasty. It, I, and I love the fact that Flash can go so fast. I believe he can turn back time with his speed. So he should be like red blue then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he's definitely manipulating time itself by moving so quickly. I think that'd be really cool to have kind of like a Noran the Wary-esque card with the Flash because he's always bouncing in and out. It's really mm. hard to target. It's a different kind of haste. Would he be like extra turns or extra combats or something? I, it almost has to be, right? I feel like he would allow you to take another main phase or take another step, but not necessarily give you a whole extra turn because I think that's a another combat step maybe yeah oh yeah that's pretty good because he can definitely hit you twice while other people he's he's faster than double strike yeah oh yeah he is flash strike uh i was thinking about it too and i think i would go with professor x Ooh, yeah i think we've i think you may have talked about this before I really like. yeah because he's it's just such a cool card yeah it, i just want to read other people's minds <laughs> I don't know. I Play don't want telepathy. I don't want telepathy because that is just a confusing card, and every time it's on the table, like it's too much information. And it slows How down. How would games. Professor X work from a gameplay standpoint? Yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe you can look at other players' hands in some way, or he also does that thing where he just pauses everybody. Me. Is that a real thing from the comics, or is that just a movie thing? It could just be a movie thing, and then they kept doing it because of that challenge that went viral. It seems way too powerful. <laughs> like, hey, I can just stop time for yeah. everybody. That feels broken, but also I would. I think in a commander game, it'd probably be quite good. And he's clearly like a blue card and i'm a blue player so. yeah yeah it's definitely more in the realm because oh becca does that right just ends the turn or oh, whatever so I, th I feel like it's professor x would need to do something that's a little more proactive but from a seated position because he doesn't go out and like fist fight people professor O. Becca. <laughs> Becca. That is actually... Phrenologist. I already built that deck. It's pretty cool. So, yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We've got uh, a few more magic-related questions left. We're not done yet. And then we'll move on to the stuff about our content creation uh, and that aspect of our channel. But first, got to take a quick break. Hear a message from our sponsors. Hey there, this is my partner, Lovestruck Beast. <laughs> and I'm his heart's desire, also known as his Valentine. 
We may not look like a perfect match, but we are! And you know what else matches? Army undies! So this Valentine's Day, why not make your life a fairy tale with matching underwear for you and your partner? Express your one of a kind relationship when you match your bottom half to your better, beastlier half in fun limited edition prints. Or if you're single, mingle in matching pairs with your friends, family, or your seven dwarven pals. You can even get dog hoodies or buddy bands to match your canine companion. So be sure to check out all of MeUndies' super cute and super soft undies, socks, bralettes, loungewear, and more available in sizes extra small to 4XL. And remember, you've got to stay comfy because love is an adventure. <laughs> MeUndies has a great offer for fans of the Command Zone. For a limited time only, get 20% off your first order of matching pairs for Valentine's Day. And as a first-time purchaser, you can also get 15% off and free shipping right to your door. To get 20% off matching pairs, 15% off your first order, free shipping, and a 100% satisfaction guarantee, go to MeUndies.com slash command. That's MeUndies.com slash command. Oh, hey, any dinner plans tonight? No time. Things have gotten so crazy this new year, I am too busy to cook or shop. Any eating has to happen at instant speed. Sounds like you need Factor. It's like Vidalcan Orrery for food. Vidalcan Orrery? I'm in. Tell me everything. All right, Factor delivers nutritious, pre-prepared meals straight to your door, and they're ready to eat in just two minutes. Whoa, that's like flash speed. Exactly. Plus, I love that Factor takes health seriously, pairing registered dietitians with expert chefs to make sure everything's nutritious. That way, Factor makes it easy for me to eat clean 24-7 with fresh, never-frozen prepared meals that are so delicious, you wouldn't believe they're actually good for you. I was blown away by the Peruvian shrimp bowl. And whether you're looking for something vegan, a bit of extra protein, or even just some energy bites, Factor's got you covered with a huge variety of options. Sounds perfect. Here, let me just adjust my calendar for the time I'm going to save with Factor and... Wait a minute. What is this blank space right here? That's free time, Josh. Oh. I've never seen that before. Head to go.factor75.com slash plans and use code COMMAND120 to get $120 off over your first five weeks of meals. That's code COMMAND120 at go.factor75.com slash plans for $120 off. Hello, we're the pair of goblins from You See a Pair of Goblins. We know we're going to be seen, so we want to look our best. Me, I like the bald look. Makes me seem tough. But I like me hair. I think it looks elegant. So when my locks started falling out, I signed up for Keeps, the simple stress-free way to stay ahead of hair loss. Oh, that's right. Just like you choose to charge and befriend us, you should have the choice to keep your hair or not. It was right easy to set up a virtual doctor consultation. Then medication showed up right at me cave door. Oh, I didn't even notice what with the discreet packaging. Plus, treatment started only 10 gold pieces a month. Or dollars, as you human folk be calling them. Thanks to Keeps, it's a new year, new air, new me. But remember, treatments take time to see results. So if you want to save your hair, start Keeps now. The choice is yours. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash command to receive your first month of treatment for free. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash command to get your first month free. Again, keeps dot com slash command. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Check out betterhelp.com slash command zone. I am rage incarnate, fury made flesh. I am the inferno titan and anger brings me power. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or, at least that's how I used to justify my behavior. The truth is, I wasn't in control of my emotions. That's why I turned to BetterHelp. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Unload the stressors and get some unbiased feedback. You'd be pretty surprised what you might gain from it. See if it's for you. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and Command Zone listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash command zone. That's betterhel dot com slash command zone. Sure, I still get angry when Sun Titan eats guacamole that I clearly labeled as mine. <clears throat> but now I can manage it. See? I barely even exploded there. All right, we are back answering some of the top, coolest, hardest hitting questions we've ever answered on this channel. Never. And this next one is gonna knock us on our butts, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> it is, because I, I had to go count. <laughs> How many commander decks do each of you own? Dun, 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 asks Sean. Thank you, Sean. Uh, I currently have 28. Whoa! And there are like three or four that I've I've opened and taken a few cards out of. Oh, so they're kind of non-functional then. And by the way, 
I'm an idiot. I don't know what cards I've taken out of those. Because <laughs> I was going through last <laughs> night, and I was like, I remember opening this box and putting it in this position so to remind myself that, hey, don't play this. Don't You've play, taken yeah, some cards yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. And nowhere did I write down like what those cards are. So I'm just looking at the deck going like, I have no that was six months ago. I don't remember what I took out of this thing. I do the same thing where I'm like, I'm so smart. I'm going to take a picture of all those cards. I take a picture. And then literally months later, like you're you said, like, you're like, uh, where is the picture? And yeah. then you look at the picture and you go, I can't even tell if some of these are foil or if that one's a... What does this picture? tell me is it telling me what's missing yeah. like, <laughs> okay so how many decks do you have i actually looked and because so many of my decks are in disarray i have seven that's it yeah but i have about 16 <laughs> that are half built or they're from game nights and i was like i like uh the colors so i'll make a new deck out of this i'm gonna take these cards out but these are just synergy pieces yeah so i have like seven fully functional i can take them with me to events decks and then i have i would say like two or three that are functional and fully to get there but they are just old and they don't have ramp in them they don't have color fixing they were just like experiments they haven't been updated since you know yeah. 2016 or so something. i guess the, the how many decks i own probably closer to 15 and some of them are dis in disarray and how many decks i actually are proud to play and are functional are is like seven to eight wow yeah. wow yeah i have 28 i could play and i gotta say about three to five of them are like I don't actually ever really play because one of them's like Mizix. Oh, I have right. a Derevi stack stack. Yeah, my Mizix stack is just sitting. I need to take that. I have a Teferi Chainville deck. I think I've played it twice in the last year. So <laughs> like real decks that I play, there's probably like 20 in the actual rotation. I, I, a better question might be how many decks have we built? Oh, yeah. And at this point, it's probably close to 100. Well, that's interesting. And, and this isn't a question that um, anybody asked. And this is a little bit about our content creation. So yeah, um, we'll, we'll be quick here. But... People often ask us, like, what happens to the decks we build in game nights? Oh, right, 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 because yeah. Because, you know, just by game nights, you have built nine or ten decks per year for the last five, five years. Five years, yeah. So, it should be 50 decks. But what what happens is we got to take those apart most of the time to use the parts for other decks for game nights. So, we don't tend to keep them around. I think there's probably, like, of all the decks, you know, we've played 50 episodes now. Um, some of them are pre-cons, obviously. I think there's, like, three to five of those decks I still own. And what I ended up doing was taking those apart and then reordering the pieces for a deck so that yeah you can the cards can go back to the the office collective pool yeah yeah exactly so how many of the decks from game nights would you say that you've kept around about three yeah yeah yeah. yeah. and one of them is in that disarray pile because i compl i was like i just like the colors i don't want to actually build this commander though yeah so we build a lot of decks for game nights and extra turns but they don't stick around forever yeah like our like our personal collection i will say my brain hurts thinking about my decks and how many of them need to get upgraded and when i do so it's like it's it's a serious retooling it's not just going in and putting new tires in the car it's like new engine new yeah. upholstery a lot of new things yep it's it, yeah it's a time commitment for sure okay all right there's a follow-up question from another audience member that's similar or at least on the same subject anthony asks do you have a method of how you like to build slash rotate the decks? Mm. For instance, do you try to avoid similar strategies or avoid color clashing? And this has to do with the decks in our own collection. Yeah, this is a great question. I 100% am very conscious about color clashing. Yeah. Uh, but if a new commander comes along that just is great, it kind of overrides everything. So you... What does that mean? Like, you're like, oh, I already have a Boros deck, so I'm not going to build another red-white deck? Yeah, so I only have one five-color deck um, because, one, the, the mana base and all that stuff, it, it's a headache to think and figure out, and I just don't enjoy playing five-color that much. So I'm like, okay, I'll just have one five-color deck. I'll rotate around. But I have three mono-red decks, one of them in disarray because but of course you're in the mono red guy yeah and i love naheb but it's a very different play style than like a kiki cheeky deck mm. so obviously those are two different decks obviously um but in if there is a color clash like i'm not going to build a bunch of simic decks for instance that sounds like the worst <laughs> that actually sounds like the most boring thing in the world to me i don't care at all about current and then i have no idea when i counted the decks i yeah. didn't like map it out i don't know how many of what i've got i know i've got a lot of th five and four color decks but i right. don't know exactly how many i have i don't care at all i'm just like yeah is this a cool strategy that i think will be fun and i don't even think too much about whether i have another deck that's that strategy although i tend to i guess i do think about that i tend to be like i already have a token deck mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and it, is and this it, different enough that i want to actually do it as yeah. i start putting together a list of cards sometimes i'll be like this feels familiar mm -hmm. all of these cards exist in my other deck that's like that and then that will often like disincentivize me from actually building the new deck or i'll take the old deck and just take those pieces if there's enough and make the new deck but in general i don't think about color combination at all there have been a couple of times too where you built the deck and you look at it and go nope 
I don't want to play this. This looks too unfun, too mean, too much of a drag or whatever it is, right? Happens a lot for game nights and stuff for yeah. sure where I'm like, because I think I am drawn towards powerful stuff and sometimes mean stuff. So I'll be like, this sounds cool. And then I'll put it together and I'll be like, this is all edict effects. This is nasty. Yeah. No one will like this. <laughs> Nothing's cool about this. This yeah. is actually painful. Which is nice. It forces me a lot of times to be like, oh, I'm going to build this attacky deck because it's not something I'm necessarily drawn to, but I'm going to do that because I think it'll be more fun. And it's caused me to find that I like things that I didn't maybe think I would like. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think my advice to you out there, if you're thinking a lot about, do I want to avoid this or whatever? I would just build to your taste at first. I know people that have five decks that are all very similarly themed and they love it and they don't want to play other stuff. So you just do what's to your taste. For There's the no part. rules, right? Nobody, if anybody shames you for like, why do you build this, you know, kind of deck all the time. Yeah. Hey, listen, I like it. I'm not asking you to eat what I eat at the restaurant every time. I'm just going <laughs> to order what I like. All right. Wow, every time you order the same thing? I don't, but... Yeah. If, <laughs> I am that kind of person. I'm a creature of habit. Yeah. But not with my decks as much. But there's nothing wrong with it. There's not... Like, yeah, I yeah. am a variety person, so I'll often order something on the menu that I haven't just because I... Oh, I want to try something new. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean I get to look down my nose. There's no right way, right? You could look down my your nose at me and be like, you order something different every time. And I can look down my nose at you and be like, you order the same thing every time. It's stupid. Neither of us is right. But one of us is objectively better. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. All right, next question... Why do you guys play Commander? What do you love about it? Did you start out playing it or did you slash do you ever play other formats? A great question from Max. So this is two questions. Let's do the... It's actually three. It's three. <laughs> or four, I guess. <laughs> why do we play Commander and why do we love it is kind of yeah, the yeah, yeah. one question and the other is format. So let's split this up. Why, uh, why do I play Commander and why do I love it? Um, I love the multiplayer part of Commander. Mm -hmm. To me, I like the social aspect of it, the fact that it feels more like hanging out with friends and the game itself is just kind of a backdrop, an excuse yeah. to that. I love the game, love the strategy of the game and everything, but in general, very casual when we play, lots of laughs, nothing's taken too seriously. I like th that about Commander. And I do also like social dynamics and playing with, you know, that kind of uh, werewolfy style, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Play, playing off of each other, making deals, finding loopholes. I find that fun as a, as a piece of a game. Yeah, I think any table that we're at, you're all, you're going to hear like at least one belly laugh yeah. per game, and that I think is a big reason both of us like to play Commander. I got into Commander the same year I got really into playing board games. Mm. And so I think that tied along really well because I love the social aspect. I love being able to hang out with people I really enjoyed ha being in the company with and learning to play new things, experimenting with new things. And Magic just happened to be the one board game that when you opened it, you were like, it was like that, you know, that Magic magical oh. cave oh. and when you walked into the cave you're like this place is way bigger than the box it came in um and so that was sort of a big part of our love for it originally and the fact that we started talking about it so much i think almost kind of convinced my brain too to like it more if that makes sense not it, it's not like in a bad way it's that it sort of accelerated our love of the format because we were turning into podcasters and talkers about it it really is that well that you just can never find the bottom of and that's mostly about magic the game of magic yeah. and how deep and complex it is so i think if we had chosen another game to do a show about we might have petered petered out after you know a few months just because most games do just cannot keep up keep yeah they they just can't you know as you go deeper and deeper and talk like you can't talk an hour a week about most sport like monopoly or something I, oh i don't think gosh. we would still I be going i think i could talk one hour about monopoly oh definitely you could talk an hour about yeah, monopoly. there's people that yeah, have like all the i like, don't want to yeah. talk an hour well about that's just because you don't love it but what i mean is like <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i think yeah, even yeah. the people who are really into monopoly probably couldn't do 450 episodes an hour a week right uh talking like they would retread the same ground a lot just because and listen, I know there's some going to be people out there who love Monopoly, and I know there's like a Monopoly competitive scene or whatever, but it's just not on the same, it's not on the same ballpark or league as Magic as far as complexity. Yeah, and not to mention the online and the gathering scene and the con convention scene started growing and growing when we were playing, so that definitely helped create more of a love for it, that we knew so many other people out there, yeah. we connected with so many people because of the game as well, and, and I think one thing that I think a lot of people don't talk about is that the game itself, in those social interactions, in the small games you play, the mini games in each game and all of that that's really complex stuff and it teaches you a lot about how to operate in life too that has i think benefit our content creation and all that stuff yeah yeah i like that all right the second part of the question is did you start out playing it or did you or do you ever play other formats so josh and i both got into limited at the same time big shout out to limited resources uh because of them we were like let's do a podcast about magic so i think we love limited for similar reasons it, cr it gives you an endless well 
every time you draft, it's different. It's a complex, really fun activity to draft cards and build decks that are themed sometimes around the most powerful thing you find or around the theme of a set that's fun to play with. And then that competition part also is a lot of fun. Yeah. Limited, I picked up and played before Commander when I got back into Magic and still love Limited. It's it's such a great way. I think it's the most difficult or most skill-testing way to play Magic. For sure. Uh, and it also embodies all the great things that make Magic a, a, an awesome game. You get to crack packs. Yep. You card evaluate on the fly. You deck build. And then you have to be a very good player of the game. You have to sequence correctly. And because the card pools are generally small, you can do things like play around effects or guess really at what your opponent's doing. Yeah. Yeah. So I love Limited to this day. We still draft, you know, as often as we can. Obviously harder during the pandemic. But whenever I play Arena, that's all I play. I don't play oh, yeah. standard do or do any historic. Or, yeah, exactly. It's all Limited. I just think Limited is great. Um, so yeah, that's the other form of play we played. We did allude to the fact that we dabbled in standard a little bit at one point i played and, a few games of modern here and there and both of us started playing on like playgrounds yeah basically i played in third grade on the cement outside of the school i cast a lightning bolt many lightning bolts on that pavement and that really kicked off my love of the game it's still it's still seared and scarred the pavement there it you better can find be. the spot yeah, yeah i'm gonna go back and sign it someday <laughs> uh, if you're interested in limited whether you love it or uh maybe you haven't even tried it uh limited resources which jimmy mm -hmm. talked about marshall and lsv um do an amazing show there are are one of the reasons our podcast exists and lords of limited is another really good one those both those shows i think are really good if you're looking to get into limited yeah and good luck high five megan and maria have talked about yep. limited quite a lot too so there's lots of good limited content out there and the streamers every streamer basically oh, just plays kenji new the ones i watch kenji yeah. caleb all those yeah they play the cube which is a lot of fun too so you know one th one thing that's interesting and another aside but this is a q a episode we can do whatever we want um <laughs> you know commander content has gotten so big uh, you know, obviously no complaints. Uh, no complaints. But when we first started playing Magic, Jimmy, the most popular content that was out there were draft videos. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And those have kind of, I'm a little bit sad that that kind of content um, is not as prevalent as it once was. And there's, you know, it's great that there's so much commander content and commander gameplay. And I know a lot of people are looking for that. But Jimmy and I, I think, are, are a testament to the fact that if you like commander, limited is something you probably also will like because we yeah. love limited and we also love commander and if that means you're kind of like us right if you like commander so it's very possible that we like the same things that you like so i would encourage you to try limited and we also don't have reasons to just crack packs we just said buy singles so limited gives us an opportunity to crack packs it's also a great way with eight friends around the table or at your local game store the, the whole drafts and all that stuff too you can do it with six people too i think that's yeah, fine yeah, and yeah, yeah. also online on arena drafting is just the best yep and it'll definitely make you a better magic player I'll say that much for sure. And sometimes you pull a card that you need for Commander. Perfect. Yeah, it's a great way to sort of trick yourself. Like, I'm allowed to open these packs because I'm going <laughs> to play limited with them. But pack cracking is fun because what am I going to get? Yeah, and Commander Legends, not to mention, is oh, was man, built so to fun. be a draft set. Same with Battle Bond, which has similarities to Commander. And then the new Commander Legends hopefully will be the same. All right, question number nine is a little bit of a tweener. It's not about magic but it's also not about content creation <laughs> i thought it was an interesting one uh though so i'll read it here it's it, very interesting it's question. from derek what do you think of hearthstone legends of runeterra digimon flesh and blood and other digital and tabletop card games have you played any of them okay so i played hearthstone legends of runeterra and like eternal a couple of the other like smaller card games that didn't really go anywhere what about you yeah i played hearthstone legends of runeterra um, I haven't played Digimon or Flesh and Blood yet. I've played a couple of the other online yeah. stuff. I played uh, Solitaire a bunch growing up. Right. <laughs> what do you think of those games? So it's interesting because I have now, through my career in LA, I've met developers for Hearthstone and Legends of Runeterra. I've been to the offices. I've seen them working on it. I've seen people playing. I've gotten early access to Legends of Runeterra. I am very, and our friends work on these games as well, actually. Sean, Main, Mel, Mel Lee, Lee, both Game Nights alums. They both work on Legends of Runeterra. Uh, I enjoyed them for the periods that I played them, but it did not have the same draw and pull that Magic did. And I don't know if it's because they're new games and I just don't care as much about the IP because I didn't play Hearthstone growing up because it didn't exist. Or if Magic is in a lot of ways sometimes a better design game or more complex or not as boring. Because Hearthstone, I think, really suffered from this problem and a lot of players can agree. They didn't really have rotation. Right. They had the same like set. They eventually kind of got their own, but it took a while. It took a long time and Magic is always this format that feels new and it's changing and evolving constantly and there's obviously lots of cards to go along with that. 
but it felt like Hearthstone just got boring really fast. I felt myself doing the same thing over and over again. Even when those formats had draft formats too, I just wasn't that interested. And the same sort of thing went for Legends of Runeterra. And I didn't, I wasn't a huge fan of the the pass back and forth format of Legends of Runeterra. Mm -hmm. And there's also uncounterable spells, which to me is like, how could you have something be uncounterable? <laughs> so I, 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 for multiple reasons, not saying these bad games are bad by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, many of them get better every single day. I think Legends of Runeterra is on an uptick right now in terms of popularity. But for me, I Magic has just been the card game for me. Yeah, it's hard when you're a Magic player not to, you know, compare those games to Magic. It's just, you can't turn off that side of your brain, even though that's not always fair. Also, all the developers, almost guaranteed, of those games play Magic. So yeah, yeah. They, well, I mean, we know for sure. That, yeah. <laughs> ones that have moved over and worked. Yeah. Um, so Hearthstone, I'm, I have the same sort of experience that you do with Hearthstone and Legends of Runeterra, or similar. I like yeah. those games, and Hearthstone to this day, Legends of Runeterra 2, I find myself playing in a short spurt. So mm. it's some a new set will come out in expansion or some new cards, or they'll change some things, and I'll play for a week. Yeah, oh, let's check out what it's about. And I have fun. But after a week, a week and a half, I feel like I've sort of found the bottom of that well. And it's not like there's not one or two percentage points to be gained by like really figuring things out. But it just doesn't feel like the same depth of complexity that Magic offers me. Yeah. And so I always end up just, you know, okay, yep, I had the fun and I got a little bit of a break. And now I'm back, you know, to playing Arena or, you know you know plan you know obviously building commander decks and things like that we're also pretty invested in <clears throat> magic obviously yes. by this point uh with commander and all that and we love tabletop first um i will say though i do play board games that are card games mm. sometimes like dominion is kind of yeah. like a drafting game so i find more entertainment from that honestly than i do from these other sort of online digital offerings i do like what you said there that is a fair i think critique of the situation that we're in because we're content creators yeah i do sort of feel a responsibility obviously to play magic because i need to you know maintain my love of the game and my knowledge of the game yeah so yeah i can't, can't it's almost like i'm not i haven't ever felt the pull but i i don't know that i would be able to allow myself to fall fully into like hearthstone or something because what what might happen like i might start to you know yeah invest in that more i don't know I, it's a weird thing to you could also about. mess up your strategy for the other game too. <clears throat> there that you happens go. quite a lot <laughs> um i think one last point to be made here is that games like digimon for instance getting a lot of popularity recently and lots of our friends play and people in the office play it as well i don't know if i'm able to i have the risk appetite to play another game that i don't know if it's going to survive yeah, it's so true a lot of games it's so just true. die sometimes. Now, if Riot's making it, Legends of Runeterra will continue going for as long as they want it to. They can just lose a billion dollars on it a year, and, <laughs> and that's still they'll be going. like, oh, darn, we only have full, you know 27 more years before we have to stop making it. Yeah. Digimon, though, I don't know. I mean, maybe it doesn't exist in two years, and then the time and the effort and the things I put into it won't feel like it has that same payoff, even if I did really enjoy the time I did playing it. So that, for me, like I really have limited time these days. So I, I have to be really careful in how I sort of split it up what was that game we tried to play richard garfield uh it had the oh yeah uh, uh, uh <laughs> it's keystone. keystone 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 keyforge 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 that's the one <laughs> yeah i don't know how pyramids work or names of things so keyforge <laughs> it's a fun it's it was really fun for the 10 times we played it and then it did not really pick up popularity the players we could play with went down and everyone just went we have magic decks you want to play magic instead yes i do and that's how it works <laughs> All right, uh, we're going to move on now to our content creator or the sort of behind the scenes for game nights and things like that questions. So if you're only here for the magic stuff, adios, thanks for sticking around. Everybody else, let's go on to question number 10. It's from Tim. About game nights, by the way. Yeah, why didn't you guys do a jumpstart episode of game nights? Oh, well, Josh, <laughs> I wasn't here, I think. I was out of town, right? That was during were the you? Mulan years? I think it was. No, I don't think so. You were back. It was like oh, okay. 2020. Well, in that case, I just couldn't get my hand on any product. <laughs> well, it, it was hard to get a hold of Jumpstart. It was also uh, the pandemic. <laughs> I think, you know, a lot of product comes out, and we work with wizards to kind of determine which ones we're going to be able to get ahead of time. And, yeah. Because, you know, we need a lot of lead time to make game nights. And I think Jumpstart just came out in a time when it was like, okay, listen, we got to pick between these three things. Because... We physically cannot produce an episode of Game Nights in less than like five weeks time. Yeah, especially now that we're adding more fun stuff to each episode. So if three sets come out, 
within a 12 week period, there is no way we can make three episodes. We have to pick only two of those sets. And I believe that is what happened with Jumpstart. Yeah. I think there's also some questions too. Like we want to make the best episode for our fans and we've heard lots of feedback that we just want commander gameplay. And so I think sometimes when we go into different things, it can be a little risky. So, it, Oh, interesting. I didn't know if Tim was asking about, yeah, maybe Tim was asking why we didn't play the actual Jumpstart format. But we yeah. also could have just built decks around the legends from Jumpstart. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's not, a good point. Yeah, yeah. We don't know what you're asking, Tim. Who knows? Yeah. Okay. This one is obviously a question you should read. Yes. Marco asks, does Freddy Wong play magic? Would you ever consider having him on game nights? Wow. So Freddy's my brother. He's a longtime content creator. Uh, it's how Josh and I met because Josh was doing some trailer advisory work in consulting. Video Game High School. Um, season video Game High School season two, two, I think, three. right? Yeah, three. Okay. Um, and so we met at the Rocket Jump offices. Matt Arnold, Freddy's business partner, also played Magic. Uh, and he joined us for that initial sort of foray into Commander. Freddy used to play Magic. So both of us are from Seattle. We grew up around, we went to the same preschool, we went to the same you know middle school, and that's where I learned to play Magic. And so Freddy, at that same time, also learned how to play. I remember playing him all the way back then. I think it was Ice Age. Um, but he hasn't kept up. And I don't blame him. He loves playing all sorts of other games. He's got really into like Tarkov. He got really into, he now he's playing a bunch of Halo. So he's more in that, that world of games, Left 4 Dead and all that. Yep. Um, so if Freddy wanted to be on game nights, he would need to do some serious studying. He would have to play <laughs> for a while because obviously game nights is not a format where a novice can really come in and and shine on the show because because the interviews and everything so yeah there's have, a lot going on and we, yeah so we just you'll notice we're just not going after anybody who doesn't play play yeah right you have to play yeah, you have yeah. to be able to talk smart about it because we want our audience to not only be able to be entertained but also to learn from you so you have to understand like what the strategy is and why you're making the moves you don't you know we're not only pro players or anything but we want it to be you know educational as well as entertaining so yeah freddie could absolutely do it because he's one of the smartest people i've ever met <laughs> so he, he definitely could if he ever put his mind to it but you know he's obviously got a lot going on you didn't mention i mean they do the dungeons and daddies podcast oh, that's right yeah they're one of the playing. most popular podcasts in the world <laughs> yeah i think it's number two the critical role for dungeons it's, and dragons by the way so it's top 50 in the world as far as on spotify as podcasts yeah they just i saw that they just got their twenty thousandth patron yep so that's wild they're obviously i mean it's, it's freddie so it's not surprising in any way but obviously killing it and, and, and very busy but if freddie if you're listening to this which i know you're not if you ever got into magic and wanted to come on game nights and you just have to say to us josh jimmy I know what I'm doing. We Only would, one may stand. We would believe you. He can come on at any time. Yeah. He'll probably yeah. kick our butts at that point too. Yeah, and I'm sure he'll do something where we'll both go like, wow, <laughs> for sure. That I didn't even <laughs> think you could ever do that, but <laughs> you came up with the idea. Cool. All right. Question number 12. This is from Seraphim. Why did you change the thumbnails for extra turns? I loved Josiah Cameron's illustrations. So what we'll do is, uh, if you're watching the YouTube video, you'll notice the early episodes of Get Extra Turns have these cool illustrations that Josiah Cameron, who does the tokens for mm -hmm, Game Nights, mm -hmm. uh, he did the thumbnails. And he did really cool stuff where he took the characters that yeah. we played, the, the legendary creatures, the decks we played, and then drew new versions of their art sort of facing off like they were about to fight. Well, I know the answer to this. Yeah, go for it. Uh, well, unfortunately, as cool as those illustrations are, when most people see them, it's on the phone, and it's about this big. So the detail gets lost. You lose the clickability of why that video, you, why you want to watch it, and you don't actually instantly know whether or not you're watching a gameplay video either, right? Yeah, I think that was the big thing. Um, and uh, you might have brought it to the attention originally, and I think it's very smart. Jimmy, obviously, been in the YouTube world for... Uh, I still make bad thumbnails, though. Sometimes. Years and years, <laughs> and is always, you know, imparting that important. wisdom. And I think, yeah, the, the illustrations, as cool as they are, they just didn't serve the purpose that we needed a thumbnail to serve, which is that the audience knows what it is and is therefore, ent you know, enticed to click on it. Yeah. Uh, because at that size, it just kind of, it looked a little bit like a blob. You couldn't tell that they were even characters. It definitely didn't speak you know, scream out to you that it was magic content mm -hmm. or gameplay. So we just had to redesign it because, you know, obviously 
when you're making content, you're spending so much time on it, you want people to know what it is and click on it and then so they have the chance to enjoy it. Yeah, and I think th- we also just know for a fact that algorithmically faces just work better for thumbnails and the way that we have it now uh, hopefully gets more people to watch the episode instead of just sort of seeing something, not really knowing what it's about because you need to capture them on multiple levels. They need to see a thumbnail, see a title, maybe a little bit of a description and all of those factors combined into whether or not they're going to click through and watch the video. And we would rather people see the video and instead of, you know, highlight art from someone that you can't even see now maybe if we like wrote an article somewhere about extra turns that would be cool the whole josiah cameron thing could be like the top splash art but that feels like a place where it actually belongs well i mean the, the good news is we established a relationship with joe and, and yeah. have used him on our tokens and really found a good place for his illustrations to shine uh that's sort of better suited for for what it is he's doing than the thumbnails are yep all right next question comes from magnus Magnus asks, who makes the music slash soundtrack for Game Nights and Extra Turns? Who is your brilliant composer? Well, Magnus, <laughs> I hate to pull the, the curtain back here for you. Uh, there's no composer. We use uh, a, an online music library, a large one called Audio Network. Mm-hmm. Um, and then some other sources occasionally will go to other music libraries. But for the most part, Audio Network is the one that we use because they have a huge library of songs and they're all categories and searchable. And so we have just over the years spent time searching through, finding the songs that sort of fit what Game Nights is um, yeah, you can search by mood, ambience, tone, Eternity, genre, per, beats per minute. Yeah, yeah all kinds of stuff. Um, yeah, it's, it just ends up being really, really good and a, and a good resource, but we don't have like one person that's composing all that music. And to be clear, each of those songs does have a composer, yes. but they're at this point, I don't know, 20, 30, 40, 50 of them that we've yeah. been using. Yeah, there's probably 25 to 35 songs that are in the regular rotation for game nights. And then when there's specialized stuff like mm-hmm. Christmas or like when we did the Strix oh. Yeah, college yeah. videos or things like that where we'll go and search for something for this specific you know like the the um, gps skit with us in the car oh, right. oh we needed spooky music that's not something that we just had sitting around we had to go through their library search for some stuff pull some options pick one we Sometimes pay for even blend other two tracks together and stuff yeah, 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 yeah layer yeah. them um, and we pay for all this stuff too you need to yeah. get the oh, licensing goodness. rights and everything and we you know we do that for sure sometimes you do pop up another video though and you just hear a da 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 you, you know like, what um, the? <laughs> is that game nights my girlfriend is uh, likes the show 90 Day Fiance. Yeah. And I have heard multiple Game Nights tracks on that show. So funny. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Question number 14 from Lo. I am interested in starting a MTG podcast, but it seems like there are so many podcasts and shows out there. How do I make an interesting podcast that people will watch? What type of topics do people generally like to listen to? Huh. Lo, lucky for you. Josh and I have done an entire podcast for this at one point. Yeah, we'll link it in the show notes. Uh, it is about content creation. I forget what we've titled it now because I think we retitled and re Content Creator this. Secrets, how to grow your channel from zero to something. Yeah, there's some some titling going on there, I think. So yeah, we definitely have a full episode that's about sort of this topic low, which we'll link in, and you can find and we'll help you. I will say in general, the question, how do I make an interesting podcast that people will watch? The, the easiest and best way for you to go about this is make something that you would find interesting that, that doesn't currently exist or you don't currently have to your taste. Yeah. So this is the reason Command Zone exists at all and I think is a pretty good barometer. Whereas Jimmy and I started playing Limited. We listened to Limited Resources. We were learning a lot, really loving that show. We started playing Commander and we naturally went, oh, let's find a podcast that's doing what Limited Resources is, is doing but for Commander. And wah, we wah, looked wah. around and we looked around and we didn't find a podcast and we were like, huh, there's that podcast doesn't exist, which is hard to believe now because there's 50 million Commander <laughs> podcasts, but at the time, you know, there was one or two. We just they just weren't easily findable. Yeah, and probably not to our taste. Not nuts and bolts. More like uh, limited resources. And so Jimmy and I literally looked at each other and said, "You want to do a podcast? Yeah, maybe we should just make that Commander podcast because it's something we would listen to, and no one else is making it. There must be other people like us that want to do this thing and listen to this podcast. Oh wait." What should we make our first episode about? Yeah. Well, how to play Commander, Commander 101. How should we make <laughs> And then our, our next few episodes. <laughs> our second and third episode were about drafting conspiracy. Yeah. Again, did we mention we like limited? But low, I would say, as you're listening to shows like this or any other shows, um, you know, what is your inner dialogue as they're talking? It, you're uh, Oftentimes, I know I'll be listening to shows and I will think like that. No, I don't agree with that at all. Here's, yeah. here's what I think about that. Write that stuff down. That is 
those are your topics. That's your point of view. That's your perspective. That's your interesting stuff to say. Listen to a lot of magic content and write down all the stuff where you're like, even if you agree with somebody, oh, that's absolutely right. And here's a point about that that they didn't even mention and I agree with them. Yeah, Write that stuff down. Now you have more topics, more points, more things to talk about. If you're feeling that stuff and you're feeling strongly about it, it's going to make good content. Yeah, and because you're interested in it, that's all the barometer you need to know that this is going to be interesting because guaranteed at least someone else out there will find the thing interesting the same way that you do. Um, I think, too, to make a podcast quote-unquote interesting, it, you need to put some amount of work into it. Yeah. You can't just be like, I'm going to sit down and figure it out as I go. You know, outlines, you've done this in high school, hopefully you've written outlines for things, you've written out points, talking points, questions, points of interest, research, and all that stuff. All of those things, people go to podcasts as an informational resource. And if they're going to listen to two hours or an hour of something or even less than that, and they don't learn anything, they're not going to have a reason to come back. So a big part of an interesting podcast to me is usually when you know that the person that's talking has done the work and they know what they're talking about so that you walk away from it going, wow, thank goodness for Hardcore History by Dan Carlin. I just learned 20 things about the Baltic War that changed the way I see modern day society. I really like that point. I think probably we haven't, when speaking on this, uh, hammered on it enough. Respect your audience, and the best way to respect your audience is to prepare mm-hmm. and give them the value of your time. Jimmy, when you're outlining an episode for our show, how many hours would you say before we hit the record button hmm. You when you're the driver of that episode? Probably four to five, depending. I mean, it's not like I'm sitting there and full blasting four hours in a row. I'll spend a couple hours on the podcast outline. I'll go look up things. I'll read five different articles and see what other people are saying. I might ask a friend how, what their opinions are and if they have any viewpoints. I'll ask the office if anyone has anything. But yeah, I'd spend anywhere between four or five, maybe even six hours, especially set reviews take oh, set reviews a little long. 12 hours of research just trying to make sure we've got all the you know all the angles covered didn't miss anything didn't make any rules mistakes yeah 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 so we're spending hours and hours and hours of time just organizing the outline so that the episodes will flow and the topics will make sense and we're not repeating ourselves and we have you know some logic to how we're flowing through the information before we even hit the record button so respect your audience do the do your work plan don't just hit record and talk nobody I'm sitting next to a guy who's been on YouTube since the very beginning. Yeehaw. Has been in Disney movies, (laughs) has like one of the most popular, is the voice of one of the most popular like animated films of the last year. And we don't take for granted that we're just going to be entertaining if we turn the podcast mics on and hit record. We don't say like, hey, our personalities are so great. People are just going to like what we say and find it awesome and funny. (laughs) Even though I have more right to assume that than almost anybody out there who's just starting their own podcast. But we still spend five to 12 hours putting the pieces of paper paper. together so that we can go through our points and, and... have our thing organized and make sense and have it well presented to everyone out there we were that entertaining maybe we should just become streamers (laughs) (laughs) and streaming is hard yeah um but by the way if you go to our patreon patreon.com slash command zone if you even at the lowest tier you get access to all of our show notes so that's a great place to also look you can see 400 plus full-on outlines of show notes how we organize it and all that stuff so that's a great resource there so you can check all that out yeah we go to the detail of like if you look at our outlines um we're literally (laughs) like putting in the outline not just what we're going to talk about, but what graphics text we want on screen oh, yeah, as it's yeah, yeah. happening. Blue banner, bl- yeah. orange banner, all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. One okay. more question to go. We're almost there. A good one. Number 15 from Sam. What advice would you give to someone pursuing a career in the creative industry? I am finishing my music degree this year and would love to be able to turn my passion into a full-time job. And I'm curious as to how you guys were able to follow your dream and make it into a reality. So this is related to the last one, and I will say we have done an episode talking about Jimmy and my journey to where we sort of are at in life, although it ends like four years ago because that's yeah. when we recorded. <laughs> um, but it's called The Creative Process, I believe. With Rob. With Rob Pryor. Pryor, yep. And my buddy, the painter. Uh, I think, actually, we renamed it and re-released it recently as like how we got here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We actually re-released it very recently. Anyway, it'll be linked in the show notes as well for you, Sam, if you want to find it. So again, we will cover this topic again very quickly. But if you literally want to hear Jimmy and my origin stories, it's in that episode. Yeah, this is a tough one, though, because the music industry is very different than the entertainment industry. It's very different than the arts industry, the theater industry, all those things. Um I dabbled a little bit in music. I've worked with producers in New York. We obviously both know this guy named Post Malone. We've seen him uh, a little bit as well in the studio. And from what I can tell, 
it is very, 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 very hard to break into music as like a big mainstream performer. But just like the movie industry, you're not going to be Brad Pitt overnight, but you can find yourself working on movies that Brad Pitt is on if you take the right steps. And if you're okay with sort of doing the backseat or behind the camera work, uh, the studio work, there's many different paths. You can look up all sorts of different producers that spent their time first as just the guy running the tape back when they did tape in the studios to the guy that started mixing it to the lady that eventually started mastering and then editing it and then eventually they work with some of the biggest artists in the world but it takes them that process of getting their foot in the door and then moving from there yeah it, the creative industry is and, and everybody that comes out of school and like has a film degree or a music degree or some sort of you know degree that's related to creativity mm -hmm. it is daunting right because it's like i want to be this thing but what's required to become the thing is is you know Love and adoration of a lot of fans and people want, that want to buy the thing. Massive and successes, number one singles. That's what it feels like. And it's just like, okay, f from where I am and where I'm trying to get to, like it just does not seem like there's a really good path there. And the one thing I would say to you, Sam, and anybody looking in the creative industry, if you want to be a writer, mm -hmm. if you want to be a painter, make music if you want to be a musician. Write if you want to be a writer. Paint if you want to be a painter. If you want to yeah. be a filmmaker, get out there and make films. Whatever the thing is you want to do, do the thing. Because I'm going to tell you right now, and probably a lot of people in your life won't tell you this, you're not good enough at it yet. <laughs> you're not. I wasn't. Jimmy wasn't. That's just the way that it is. There's very few people that at the age of 22 or whenever you're getting out of school... Are going to be good enough. Are yeah. good enough. You're not Billie Eilish. You're not Post Malone. And if you are... More power to you. You're going to be fine. <laughs> right? Because yeah. you're a genius. You're like one in a, in a billion or whatever. But... The better scenario, the more realistic scenario is that you can become good enough at it. But too many people wallow in wanting to become the thing and right. don't actually work on their craft. Make music if you want to be a musician. Make a lot of music. Keep making music. Yeah. Because that's how you're going to become good at the craft of making music. I know so many friends that want to be writers, but they don't write anything. So they're really just wannabe writers. Write screenplays. <laughs> I just don't know anybody who's writing all the time who didn't become a paid writer of some kind. At some point, right. Yeah, now, through. they're not going to be Lawrence Kasdan necessarily, right? Like, mm -hmm. they're not going to be the, the biggest, you know, William Goldman or something. That's that's not... You don't. You can't control that part of it if you're going to be, like, one of the top, you know, 100 geniuses to do the thing that you want to do of all time. But can you make a living as a writer? Can you be a staff writer on a TV show? Oh, heck Can yeah. you write articles and get paid? And what you're doing day to day to pay your rent is typing on a computer, writing? Mm -hmm. Yes. Anybody can get to that level. And that's a great life. Yeah, I, um, I'm friends with someone named Jen D'Angelo, and she's now writing on major shows, movies. You see her names in the presses all the time. I knew her 10 years ago. We were in a, a level one improv class, and she was taking the class because she wanted to become a better writer. She wanted to learn how to do improv comedy to do so, and that was one of the many reasons, obviously. But I, a big part of also doing the creative craft is learning whether or not you are capable of doing the creative craft. I think a lot of people also have dreams of doing something, and then when they get down to it, they go, I don't enjoy this. I don't like doing this. I don't want to do any more of it. And so that is a really quick way to find out if you're actually suited for what your dreams are. And I think that's really important because if you don't match with the actual work that it takes to become the best at something, then you're going to have a long road ahead of you and i think another important thing too is find people that can mentor you find people that can you can go for advice watch videos master classes like you're not just dipping a toe into the water of your craft try and jump full head on because otherwise you're not going to be able to see things right the people that have been swimming in that pool for longer are going to know oh at that part of the pool it's this deep and down there there's this secret but you can only get there after you practice holding your breath for two days and so you got to be able to get to those points i think for creative stuff to be able to understand how far you have to go in certain cases how much you have to try at something to get to the point where it starts to feel like you're actually that thing. I love what you said there. Preach on, Jimmy. If you can get around people that just be around people that are doing the thing you want to do. Yeah. The value of it is insane. As Jimmy mentioned, we've both had the opportunity, insane opportunity to sort of hang out with Post Malone in the recording studio while he's doing some of his music. And I got to say, like, I learned an amazing amount of stuff just by being a fly on the wall in the room while they're doing stuff. And so... By the way, you can watch documentaries where the Beatles literally yep. are doing this. Yep. And you can learn just as much. It's all out there. You don't need to be friends with celebrities to do that, right? Yeah. 
So just try and get around those people. They, you know, the, I think we've referenced this on the show before, but one of the things they say about the Williams sisters in tennis, uh-huh. so Venus and Serena Williams, you know, two, two of, of the greatest, greatest tennis, tennis players. players of all time. Yeah. And one of the things they say about them is that happened because there are two of them. Oh. If there was one, there's probably nobody around that has the skill, especially they came out of Compton uh, or Inglewood or, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. East Tough LA, cent- yeah, South Central or whatever, where there's, it's just not known for a place that cultivates great tennis talent. Right. Right. And but because they are, you know, obviously supremely naturally talented, but if they didn't have another person to push them right, right. and to show, then how could they ever get, you know, keep pushing each other to the point where they dominate the sport. And so getting yourself around other people that are, you know, involved in what you want to do. Yeah. It's a phenomenal how much that will make you better and make them better. And, you know, ultimately, you know, lead you to where you want to go, which is again, I think being able to do the thing professionally and make your living at yeah. it. And then the rest is like gravy. If you can, you know, become the next year musician. So if you can become the next post Malone or whatever, yeah, you know, I, ho- I hope you can Sam. Think about it too. Like if I was, if I wanted to edit trailers and I got to hang out with Josh, Josh has accumulated probably over what? 10,000 hours just working as an editor. Yeah. That is an infinite amount of time more than you have done so far. And if there are two Joshes in the room, that's 20,000 hours of accumulated knowledge. I believe I'm personally at 40,000 hours or something. Just watch Josh and another editor talk for two hours and you have a masterclass on so many different things, even the way way that they approach a problem, right? Watching people like the Serena and and the Williams sisters train, you see how hard they work. You see how they're doing it. You see their mentality. If they fall down, how do they get back up? All of those things add up to becoming a better person at the craft that you're trying to master. All right. All right. To the listeners... What questions do you have for us for a future Q&A episodes? We're always looking for cool topic ideas. I will say some of the big questions we get from listeners, they do end up turning into full-on podcast episodes when we feel yeah. like that the meal is Dude, full. Dude, the haste up. one might turn into a full-on podcast. Yeah, it's interesting. I'll have to think about that one some more. So definitely, we, we love everybody out there that listens to our show. And you can help us a lot by just like you know, asking us questions and letting us know what you're interested in or what particular parts of our show you enjoy because when we get that information, we will generally run with it. Mm -hmm. And of course, make sure you check out our sponsors, channelfireball.com slash command. We talked about a lot of stuff today. Maybe it's got your brain going about a new idea or a new tactic you want to try in-game. Well, the best way to do that is actually get the cards once you finalize your decisions. Go to channelfireball.com slash command. You're going to be shopping from hundreds and thousands, maybe not hundreds of thousands, thousands and thousands of local game stores from across the country and world. You're going to be supporting them as well as getting great deals on cards straight to your doorstep. Nothing better than that. Yeah. I don't know if there are hundreds of thousands of LGSs in the world. <laughs> Probably not. That's probably shooting a little bit high, but yeah, definitely yeah, thousands. Definitely thousands. Yeah. And once you get all those cards, remember you want to protect them. Ultra Pro creates the products that Jimmy and I trust our own personal collections to. And you know that we don't want our cards to get dinged up, scuffed up, ruined in any way. Magic cards do have a lot of value and they tend to increase in price over time. So you want to, you know, maintain the value of that stuff. Yes. Yeah. So Eclipse Sleeves. Nice Ultra Pro Playmat Satin Tower deck boxes. Ooh, even like the Playmat tubes. I love those. Oh, yeah. Those are great because we have some Playmats here that we got in Vegas in like 2015 or whatever that are actually worth a decent amount of money just by virtue of just being old. Mine's a Lightning Bolt signed by Christopher Rush. And oh, you, I was oh, like, you got it signed by Christopher oh, Rush? Yeah, and I don't even touch it anymore because I consider that thing sacred. You got to so. frame that thing. I know, seriously. That's pretty cool. <laughs> All, All right. right. Oh, and step where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic. I feel like we talked a lot of cool things today. Uh, do you have anything? Uh, uh, hold on. Netflix documentaries. You got a Netflix shows. documentary? Hey, how about an update on how Wheel of Time is going? Uh, oh, no. Okay, maybe not. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I don't like to be critical. You know this because I've been involved with too many pieces of media that I know that it's not like people's fault. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. it and takes a village. Yeah, it's too easy to be like, this is bad and get mad at people about it. And I know how hard it is to make uh, good stuff. But Wheel of Time, I was, you know. Excited uh, for. I was excited for. And as I watched it, I was like medium on it. I was like, okay, you know, it's not not amazing. I mean, uh, to me, uh, but then it kind of got better and I was got a little more hopeful. And then uh, the the season finale kind of lost me a little bit. I was a little bit disappointed. I mean, obviously, I'm a huge fan of the show. So, and it got greenlit, I heard, for two more seasons. So, it does it just, will it, do you think it's a good investment of time if someone's looking to watch the series but doesn't want to read the books? Um, Or would you still recommend the books? I think I would still recommend the books. They're not perfect or anything, but it, you can watch the show. I mean, it just depends on how much free time you've got. Ah, okay. That's a good way. That's a great way, right? It's not like a must watch sit down. Yeah. Everyone's talking about it. How much free time do you have? If so, fit it in. 
You haven't watched it? No, I haven't. I was kind of waiting for you to tell me. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I, I would watch something else probably. It's. I was trying to think of something else though. I think everybody's like, like we are. I'm assuming you are, Jimmy, which is like, it's the pandemic. I've watched everything. Yeah, I've heard Yellow Jackets is really great. Uh, A lot of yeah. people are talking about that. It online. looks scary, and my girlfriend won't watch scary things. <laughs> no, same thing goes for me too. <laughs> what about Witcher like, Two? Did you watch Witcher Two? Uh, not yet. I've seen Witcher One. I liked it a lot. So I hope Witcher Two is great. It seems fun. Have you seen it? Yeah, I've we seen can it. talk about then. Yeah, I've seen. We'll have two in steps today. Nice, nice, uh, nice. I've seen it, and I don't want to give away anything. But yeah, I think it's it's a little better than Wheel of Time. Nice. Well, it's continuing the tradition of being okay adaptations. Have you, did you read the books, Witcher books? At I all? did not. I played the games, and I know the books are a very different beast. But I heard the books are incredible. I haven't read the books, so that may be the difference too. If I read the books, oh, you'd have maybe a different, I, yeah, yeah. Because you know, there's this dichotomy. Um, that happens where is dichotomy the right word there's this uh, dynamic i guess is okay. probably the better word where if you've read the book of a thing you tend to be a lot more critical of the thing and yes. i'm aware of that yes, right yes. so that might, might be my position with wheel of time because i have certain expectations and certain things i loved about it and they change and subvert things which if you haven't read the books might be totally fine and not bother you you don't I even see. notice yeah but you're like oh why did they do that yeah so somebody who read the witcher books is probably going no it was not good josh and here's why <laughs> and it's the same arguments i would make for wheel of time so i don't know Whichever fantasy series that starts with a W that you want to watch, go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Clean up step. Big thanks to our amazing team here at the Command Zone. Arthur Meadowcroft, Shauna Gillis, Damon Lenz, Lady Danger, Manson, Lung, Craig Blanchett, Ashlyn Rose, Joss Murphy, Jake Boss, Patrick Nan, Jordan Pridgen, Sam Walder, Garav Galati, Truck Ty, Jamie Block, Evan Limberger, and our brand new IT guy, Mitch Trafford. And special thanks to Jeffrey Palmer for the living card animations that begin in uh, the show and sometimes sit behind us here. He did this. This is Days, the invocation. Love it. You can find Jeffrey uh, on Twitter at LivingCardsMTG. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for sending us in questions, and we will see you for the next one. Bye-bye. Peace. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>